Okay, here we're on chapter three, determining change derivatives. Now we're on section 3.3 .3 on rates of change for functions that can be composed. <clears throat> so we've been looking at simple derivative rules which allow us to write rates of change functions for linear, exponential, logarithmic, quadratic, and cubic models. And we've also done a little bit with sine and cosine, but not too ex uh, extensive. But now we're gonna look at logistic and sine models and other functions that are constructed through composition and more basic functions. So we're gonna look at those composed types of functions. And so what we're gonna do is look at the chain rule for derivatives to be able to write rate of change functions for functions that are composition of simple functions. Now I wanted to note that uh, on page 212 in our book, uh, the labels aren't correctly done to fit the text about them. So this should be uh, the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit, and this should be f of t. And so this kind of, I, I, and because of that, I'm not sure if the actual graph is even even correct for that, but uh, that's that's kind of a issue I see uh, with this one is it didn't have the right figure 3.29. Now the others, I think at least the T one here is now this one again, because it's the same as this one. I don't know if it's it's correct or not either. So, you know, that's that's something to note is those figures aren't aren't correct on on that page and therefore the labeling isn't correct either. All right, so the chain rule for functions that can be composed. Well, when the input of a function is itself a function, what we have is, you know, one function then we're going to plug in something into the other function and we get a composite function. So an example is, you know, if we have f of t and t of x, what we can do is take t of x, plug it in place of t, and then we get f of t of x, okay? And those are the ways we can, you know, compose a function by inputting that t of x into the f of t. Or whatever, you know, maybe if we had f of g and then we had g of p, then we could have f of g of p. So, you know, it, it can go in any way. Now the rate of change of the output function is basically going to be multiplied or scaled by the rate of change of the input function to calculate the rate of change of the composite function. So <clears throat> basically our rate of change of the composition of the two functions is going to be the rate of change of the output times our rate of change of the input. So what we're going to do is we're going to find the derivative of one times the derivative of the second one. Okay, and that's why it's called the chain rule for derivatives, because we're going to do one, then we're going to do the next link, do the derivative of it, and we're going to do that for however many we have uh, inputting. So maybe we have f of t, of g, of p, of q, of x. And then, you know, we'd have all those we'd have to do uh, actual uh, derivatives of, and then we just multiply them together. So basically, it's going to link the derivatives of two functions to obtain the derivative of their composite function. Or again, it could be multiple functions. So this is what it kind of looks like in mathematical terms. If we have a function f and it's a function of t and t is a function of x, then the derivative of f with respect to x is, so when we have the derivative of f with respect to x, that's gonna be the derivative of f with respect to t, which is gonna be you know our f prime of this one, times the derivative of t with respect to x. So then we have the derivative of this one. Now, in other forms, what that says is we have f prime of x is equal to f prime of t times t prime of x, okay? And so that's how, how that's going to work. And so if we kind of go back here, that's kind of what we had here, f of t of x. So we're going to have, you know, t prime of x here, and we have f prime of t here, and then that's going to be f prime of x in the first one there. All right, so let's look at an example where we're actually doing that. So if we have the function f of t equals 3t squared and t of x is 4 plus 7 ln x, then our rate of change function is what we're going to look for. The f of t, uh, the derivative of it, with respect to x is determined as follows. Well, first, what, what is our function f of t actually going to be? So what I did was I went ahead and plugged in t of x into f. So I took this and plugged it in place of t. And so that gave me three times four plus seven ln x squared. So that is going to be what I'm going to be finding the derivative of. Now, just doing that directly, that's not going to be you know easy because we'd actually have to square this whole thing and then and then work our way through and get everything. But we don't have to do that. What we can do is we can first determine df dt. So <clears throat> take the derivative of this. Well, if we take the derivative of this, two times three is six t to the first. So we get just six t. Then we take the derivative of t of x, and that's dt dx, dt dx, 
and that's t prime of x. And so that's a constant, so that goes to 0. Then we have a 7 times, well, the derivative of ln of x is 1 over x, so we have 7 over x. And so that's going to be our t prime of x. And so f of t uh, prime of x is just df dt dt dx, which is just going to be 6t times 7 over x. But now you notice we don't have the same units here. So what we have to do is we have to get everything in terms of that x. So what we're going to do is we're going to replace t again with this. And we plug that in here. And so that comes into place. Now we have 6 times the 4 plus 7 ln x times 7 over x. And again, I'm just going to leave it as that. I'm not going to distribute or anything else. I'm just going to leave it as that. That way we can see where all the parts come from. You know, that's the t. <clears throat> we got the 6, you know, from coming here and getting that. And then we took it times the t. And then we have 7 over x, which was the derivative of that. So that's where I would leave it at this point. Now, <clears throat> composite models can be created by input alignment. So some of the simplest examples of function compositions arise when the input of a model has been aligned by adding or subtracting, basically shifting, or multiplying and dividing, which is basically your scaling. So, you know, we're going to shift one way or the other way, or we're going to scale up or down. You know, we're going to make it taller or, or whatever, okay? And then the derivatives of functions that can be nested, we can use the chain rule, like I was talking before, repeat it as many times as necessary to work on sets of functions that are composed of a nested uh, set of functions. And so an example might be, <clears throat> if we have this list of functions here, f of g, g of h, h of j, j of x, okay? And so that's ln of g, 5h plus 2, e to the j, and 4x minus 1. So what do we do? Well, we could take derivatives of that pretty quick. Well, the derivative of this is just going to be 1 over g. And that's what I put over here. And then we have 5h plus 2. The derivative of that is just 5, because that's a constant. It goes away. That h has a 1 here, and it goes to times 5 is 5. And then it goes to 0, so it's just 1. e to the j, well, the derivative of that is just e to the j. And here we bring the negative 1 times 4. So we have negative 4x, and then we subtract 1 to the negative 2. Okay, so that's our two kind of functions, set of the normal and the set of derivatives. So let's say we want to find f of x. So what does that mean? Well, we're going to have to take and plug in j of x into h, and then plug that into g, and plug that into f. Okay, and so if we think about that, if we do that, we're going to plug in 4x minus 1 in place of j. So it's going to be e to the 4x minus 1. Now we have to plug that whole thing, which is now h, into here. So we'll have 5, and then we'll have e to the 4x minus 1. And so at this point, we're right here. And then plus 2. So then we have that. And then we take that whole thing and plug it in for g. And so we'll just have the ln of that piece there. <clears throat> and so what we did was we just plugged in j of x into h, and then that into g and then that whole thing into f and that's we just kind of went backwards and plugged it in as we went and we have that whole thing so we know then based on a derivative chain rule here we can take and say well f prime of x is just going to be f prime of g times g prime of h times h prime of j times j prime of x and we have what we're going to need here okay so now we just actually just do the plugging in here. So then we have 1 over g. Well, what was g? g was 5 e to the 4x minus 1 plus 2. So 1 over that is this. And so that's how we get that. So sometimes when you have just the g here, we have to come back over and say, hey, how did I get that? Well, that was plugging all this into here, and we get the 1 over uh, the g. And then it's times 5 times e to the j. Well, what was j? Well, j was 4x minus 1, so e to the 4x minus 1. And then times j prime, which is minus 4x to the minus 2. And so then that whole thing is going to be like the nested derivative to give us the overall f prime of x. So it's a lot of work to get to it and a lot of work to plug it in, but it's a lot easier than trying to take that derivative on your own and try to figure it out to get to what we have here. Okay, so let's stop there and I'll come back for more.